Major breaking news out of the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. A major oral argument went on for about an hour today as to whether or not Delaware's so-called assault weapon ban and magazine ban are constitutional or not. Big fight today. Let me break it down for you when we get back one second from now. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of the Four Boxes Diner, proud American gun owner, constitutional attorney, member of the U.S. Supreme Court Bar, and author of many books, including Disarm, What the Ukraine War Teaches Americans About the Right to Bear Arms. All right, today, major oral argument. Okay, going to break this down with some procedure. There's two types of laws in the world. There's procedural laws, which is how a case process is processed through the system. Then there's substance, like what does the law mean? Like what does the Second Amendment mean? Is an example of substantive law. This is an important distinction to understand what happened today in the three-judge panel fight in the case of Delaware State Sportsman Association versus the Delaware Department of Safety over Delaware so-called assault weapon ban dealing with semi-automatic rifles. Okay, so it was a three-judge panel. The judge, the panel was not very good for us. Judge Bebas, who's very strong on the Second Amendment, but he's very savvy. We'll see what happens with him. Judge Montgomery Reeves, a Biden appointee, um, no, probably not good on the Second Amendment, although she did help out in the concur with the concurrence in the range case dealing with nonviolent felons. She did concur in that en banc decision. So that was kind of interesting, but I'm not sure we can count on any Biden appointee to strike down a quote-unquote assault weapon ban. It's just not in their nature. And then we have the 88-year-old, 88-year-old Judge Roth, who's absolutely useless and hopeless on Second Amendment issues. Um, Absolutely a waste of time there. So Judge Roth, uh, no good. Senior status judge. Uh, she's clearly going to rule against the Second Amendment and against Americans in all purposes. She's pro-government. Nothing we can do about that. So she's a, a loser on this issue. So now we have to move forward. What happened today at the oral argument was quite interesting that uh, this procedural posture, and this is very important to understand this, procedural posture of this case came up in a request for a preliminary injunction. Now, remember, I've told you that the U.S. Supreme Court doesn't like to take cases that are not on final judgments. So this case of Delaware State Sportsman Association, or DSSA, came up in the context of a preliminary injunction, meaning the plaintiffs asked the district court judge to enter a preliminary injunction in joining the law. Now, this should have been an easy case. If you simply apply Heller, the in common use test, the Second Amendment should prevail. That is clearly the right answer, but you have these lower court, inferior court judges as defined by Article 3 of the U.S. Constitution trying to resist it off every turn. This is mass resistance on the part of blue state judges and blue state politicians to you know, thumb their nose at the Supreme Court and the Second Amendment. They're very angry that they have to respect our right to be armed. They want a monopoly on violence and force for themselves, and they don't want you to have it because you are a peasant and you are a peon, and they are special snowflakes and they are the elites. Nevertheless, that is the context in which this case came up. So the big fight was whether or not an injunction should issue. The district court judge says, no, it should not for a whole host of reasons, including that uh, these gun bans do not violate the Second Amendment. Obviously, it's hooey, but that's what the ruling was. So now in front of this three-judge panel, I would say this panel is probably two to one against the Second Amendment. It is not a good panel. At best, it's a marginal panel, marginally bad panel. Uh, it's either a terribly bad panel or a marginally bad panel panel, probably a marginally bad panel. You at least have Judge Bebos there who's going to be, uh, who's pretty good on the Second Amendment. He actually follows the law. Uh, but the other two judges, let's just say, no guarantees there. So the fight today went on for over an hour. And what's interesting is they laser focused on whether or not the plaintiffs had uh, established the four elements of a preliminary injunction. The four elements of a preliminary injunction are that the plaintiff has to come forth and say that number one, we're likely to succeed on the merits of the claim. Number two, there's irreparable harm to me, the plaintiff, meaning the Second Amendment plaintiff, if you don't grant this relief. Uh, this is in the public interest and the balance of the equities weigh in favor of the plaintiffs. And basically in a normal preliminary injunction, fight involving a lot of cases, especially commercial fights, which is what I specialized in in practice, where you're fighting about money and you're fighting about you know, corporations and shareholders and all this sort of very complex hedge fund and private equity stuff. Um, preliminary injunctions are very complicated and every single one of those four factors gets litigated to the death. But when you're dealing with a fundamental constitutional right, which you are here in the context of the Second Amendment, these cases are a lot easier procedurally because if you think about it, once you establish that a government law violates a fundamental individual right, such as the Second Amendment, the other three factors that are to be considered really kind of are subsumed within the first. Because again, the irreparable harm 
to the plaintiff is they're losing the fundamental or they're having a fundamental individual right infringed upon, and that's what counts. To the extent the government wants to argue that they will suffer irreparable harm because of an injunction being entered, well, of course, what they're really arguing would be a version of interest balancing test, right, which is not allowed in Second Amendment litigation, both by the language of Heller and the language of Bruin. So again, once the Second Amendment plaintiff establishes that they're likely to prevail on the merits of the Second Amendment claim, the rest should flow naturally from that. That's what we saw in the Ninth Circuit in the Baird case, for example, that once you establish that a Second Amendment violation is going to occur, it means that the plaintiff is going to suffer irreparable harm, the defendant has, and the defendant government has no interest in enforcing an unconstitutional law because the balance, and again, one of the other elements is the balance of the equities here. The Supreme, the, the, the Supreme Court has pointed this out, that the founding fathers already did the balance of the interest when they adopted the Constitution itself, when they adopted the Bill of Rights. They already weighed the good of guns versus the bad of guns, the good of free speech against the bad of free speech, right? They already assessed the good and the bad of all these concepts, and they established the Bill of Rights. So it's not appropriate for a government court or any court to step in and to try to rebalance away these values that the Founding Fathers already balanced and came up with the Bill of Rights. So when it comes to procedurally, these should be very straightforward and easy cases. But there was a lot of questions going back and forth as to whether or not the plaintiffs had done enough to establish irreparable harm and these other things. And I thought that the lawyers for the Second Amendment team basically did a pretty good job pointing out that, hey, uh, Judge Bebas and panel, we're not aware of a single situation where a court found a violation of a fundamental individual right and at the same time in this case refused to enforce or I should say refused to enjoin that unconstitutional law. So I thought it was very interesting how the Second Amendment plaintiff's lawyers pushed back on the panel and I thought it did a pretty good job of refuting the notion that a Second Amendment plaintiff has to do more than simply show they are likely to prevail on the merits and the rest should naturally flow there too for the reasons I've just articulated and that other courts have articulated. So I thought that was very interesting. Now, let us go on to some of the substantive arguments here. Yet again, the anti-gun lawyers, the lawyers for the state of Delaware, for the government supporting the gun control laws of Delaware, basically argued the same sorts of arguments that we've seen before, specifically in the Heller case. They, for example, relied on this argument that says the in common use test by Americans for lawful purposes cannot possibly be the test because it's circular, right? That if it's popular, it can't be banned. If it's not popular, it can be banned. That makes no sense. Well, of course, we know immediately that is not the the case because the U.S. Supreme Court specifically already addressed this argument. Let me remind you, and again, if you watch the channel here at the Four Boxes Diner, the odds of an argument coming up that you haven't heard about on this channel and you do not have the answer to it from this channel is not super high. And here's another example. Again, the arguments for the, De De the state of Delaware today said that the in common use test was circular. But as we've talked about before, Justice Stephen Breyer already made this argument in his dissent in the Heller case in 2008, and the Supreme Court rejected it. Specifically, Justice Breyer writes as follows. In essence, the majority determines what regulations are permissible by looking to see what existing regulations permit. There is no basis for believing that the framers intended such circular reasoning, period, close quote. Well, that sounds kind of familiar, right? Well, that's not a new argument, even though this is the argument advanced literally today in the year of our Lord 2024. Justice Breyer already raised this argument against the in-common use test, in common use test in Heller, and it was rejected. So why is this? Why are these arguments by the gun controllers keep getting brought up and up and up? And the answer is because these lower inferior courts, as defined by Article Three of the Constitution, are allowing them to get brought up again because they're not slapping them down, which is what they should do and what the Supreme Court would do. Now let me carry on. There was a big set of arguments here. The the lawyers for uh, the government of Delaware. I thought the lawyers for the state of Delaware and for the party's argument in favor of gun control. I thought the lawyers actually did a good job. I think they were pretty articulate, made the best arguments they could. I don't think they're winning arguments if you're honest at the end of the day in front of the Supreme Court, but I thought they did a good job arguing with what they had. One of the big arguments, and we've talked about it here on this channel, that the anti-gun movement wants to do is they want to make it extremely time-consuming and extremely expensive for people to vindicate their Second Amendment rights. And one of the great ways to do that is to force trial upon trial and evidentiary hearing upon evidentiary hearing and to use experts, 
right? They want to make it extremely expensive, make it very complicated, time consuming to have these big trials with 100 witnesses, blah, 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 they, for a whole host of reasons, not least of which is the anti-gun community has infinite resources. And the Second Amendment community does not have infinite resources because we don't control, control like every Ivy League school and we don't control the government and we don't control every public health facility, blah, blah, blah. You get the point, okay? And I don't think we they have that many billionaire donors like the other side appears to have. So when that said, it's always in the anti-gun side to make these cases as expensive as possible. And part of that kind of you know seep through today in arguments, in my opinion, because there was a lot of talk today about how the plaintiffs have to put on all this evidence and there needs to be cross-examination of experts and there needs to be a trial and there needs to be cross-examination and there needs to be you know evidence and there needs to be like documents and there needs to be this proof and that. You see what I'm saying? Okay, we've talked about this before. Okay. The anti-gun movement wants to talk about all this evidence in these big full-blown trials. I guess the O.J. Simpson trial. Okay. Let me ask you this. We've talked about this before. How many trials, evidentiary hearings, and experts were used in Heller? Zero. In Bruin? Zero. In Caetano versus Massachusetts in 2016? Zero. In McDonald versus Chicago in 2010? Zero. So how is it that the Supreme Court is able to decide Heller, McDonald, Catano, and Bruin all without trials, all without massive evidence, all without hearings, all without experts, all without testimony, all without cross-examining witnesses, and rule on the Second Amendment robustly? And yet now today, in 2024, all these government defendants, like the state of Delaware, wants to all this evidence and all these hearings and all these trials and all this stuff. Why? We know it's not appropriate. And yet that was a big discussion at today's oral argument in the Delaware State Sportsman Association versus Delaware case. Again, there is this tension between what is necessary, which all the plaintiffs have to do in the Second Amendment case is to show that semi-automatic rifles like AR-15s and magazines that hold more than 10 rounds are arms textually, which they clearly are. There's not a real dispute about that. And that shifts the burden to the government to do a historical analysis. But when it comes to arms ban cases, the constitutional test at the historical level has already been established by Heller. And there's two bases for understanding. This was brought up at today's argument. There's two historical bases for why the income use test by Americans for lawful purposes, meaning if Americans use these weapons or they own these weapons, in, their income use, i.e. Americans own these weapons for lawful purposes, that's game over. They cannot be banned. Now, there may be other ways that you can protect arms from gun bans. There may be other approaches and other theories and whatnot. But for basically today, with these easy cases of AR-15s and magazines, for today, all we need to do to win is show their income use by Americans for lawful purposes. That's it. It's sufficient. We win the case. And there's two reasons why this is part of the history. Because the anti-gun community and the lawyers today, for example, Delaware, were trying to argue that the income use is part of the plain is part of the plain text, and thus the plaintiffs have the burden to prove it. That is simply not true. Because textually, the Supreme Court has already defined what an arm is. It's anything that can be used offensively or defensively can be used offensively or defensively. That's it, period, full stop. If it can be used offensively or defensively, it's an arm at the textual level and it's protected presumptively. And then the burden shifts to the government to show it can be banned as a matter of history. And they can't do it with arms banned. And there's two historical things. And I want you to pay attention to this. Write this down if you're a student or a lawyer or law clerk. Write, write these two points down. It's very important to understand. The reason why the income use test meaning the income used by Americans for lawful purpose test, is part of the historical analog or the part of the historical uh, prong of the methodology of Heller and Bruin is because of what Heller said about the income use test. It derives from two historical traditions. The first historical tradition that the income use test draws from or arises from in Heller is the common tradition, historically at the time of the founding, that Americans would bring their commonly owned weapons with them to militia musters. So when you had a militia muster in your town, you were asked to bring your weapons that you owned on the farm or in your homes or in your whatever, your, your version of an apartment back in Boston in the day, right? You would bring your muskets, your, your, your Kentucky long rifles. You would bring your pouches. You would bring your black powder. You would bring... Um, uh, you know, all the little cartridges and all the paper, you know, cartridges and all that stuff. You would bring all of that from your home. Thus, commonly owned weapons are obviously protected because that's what was used at militia busters in 1791 and 1792 at the time of our founding. That's one historical prong why in common use 
Weapons in common use are clearly protected. The second historical prong is what the Supreme Court talks about, where they say there is a tradition of banning the carrying, the carrying of dangerous and conjunctive, dangerous and unusual weapons. So that because there's a historical tradition of banning dangerous and unusual weapons, it means by definition, if something is commonly owned, it's not unusual and thus it cannot satisfy the dangerous and unusual standard that government argument could meet to show that something can be banned. So because of the prong of the militia prong and the dangerous and unusual carriage prong historically in American life, Guns, weapons, magazines that are in common use by Americans for lawful purposes simply cannot be banned. And that is the case right here and right now. And the last point I want to drive home that was discussed, and correctly so, during this argument is simply this. The reason why you don't need to have any evidence or any of these hearings is because it doesn't matter what gov government doesn't get to decide how I protect my family. Government doesn't get to decide how we the people get to protect our families and ourselves and our communities. That's up to we the people. That's the whole idea. And this is the critical language from Heller that was discussed and quoted actually by the Second Amendment attorneys today in the Delaware State Sportsman Association. Here's what they said from Heller itself. Powerful quote. We've talked about it before on this exact channel. Whatever the reason, handguns are the most popular weapon chosen by Americans for self-defense in the home and a complete prohibition of their use is invalid. So there you have it. The Heller course court specifically said, it doesn't matter. Whatever the reason why Americans choose to have these guns, as long as it's lawful, whatever the reason is, that's enough. That gives them, that's sufficient, sufficient. It's not necessary, but it's sufficient to have these weapons be protected. And because AR-15s, semi-automatic rifles and magazines are protected arms, they're commonly owned, they are protected arms under the Second Amendment. And the last thing I want to say is just to show you how terrible Judge Roth is. She's a total lost cause on this issue. But just to show you how bad Judge Roth is, uh, the 88-year-old judge from uh, from George H.W. Bush, she asked about mass shootings. And of course, we know the Heller court was well aware of mass shootings using weapons in 2008 because in 2007, which we've talked about on this channel before, in 2007 you had the Virginia Tech mass shooting with handguns and quote-unquote large capacity magazines that killed dozens of people. And the Supreme Court in 2008 and Heller was well aware of this and still said that handguns cannot be banned despite the fact that you had the Virginia Tech shooting a year earlier and that was litigated and discussed at the Heller case in amicus briefs. So that's the quick response to Judge Roth referencing mass shootings as a new press, a new unprecedented societal change. Beyond that, as I've talked about in my article in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, if you look at the language about unprecedented societal change or technological change, it specifically excludes the Heller case from that because it says in cases other than Heller, other than Heller, you can talk about more loosey-goosey analogs potentially if you're dealing with unprecedented societal change or unprecedented technological change, but it specifically carves out Heller because it says in cases other than Heller, I talk, we've talked about this on the channel and in my article in the Harvard Journal Law and Public Policy, a very important, I don't know if that article was cited to the Third Circuit, it probably was, but I actually don't know that, but it probably was is my guess because most of my articles get cited to most of these courts most of the time, uh, but I'm not sure if it was here. It should have been. I'm not sure it was. I'm guessing it was. Okay. So anyway, so uh, so what's going to happen? That's probably what you're asking me. Here's what's going to happen. Uh, we're either going to win this case two to one, which I think is probably not going to happen. And by win this case, I mean on a preliminary injunction, I think what's more likely to occur, we're going to lose three to nothing on the procedural, procedural process of a preliminary injunction. I think that's what's going to happen. Um, that's my guess. I'm not saying that's the right answer, but I think that's what's going to happen here, that the preliminary injunction, because again, this is on a preliminary injunction posture, and courts don't like to necessarily get involved with that. They prefer final judgment. Certainly the Supreme Court does. There was a lot of pushback here, for example, why the plaintiffs took so long to seek a preliminary injunction. Not sure that was a fair criticism by the panel, but that did come up. So I'm guessing we will probably lose this, and it will be sent down for further fact-finding and further work by the district court, uh, but only time will tell. And of course, hopefully, the U.S. Supreme Court will grant Sir and Bianchi uh, that will solve all these problems and get to the right answer fast, which is what should occur. I don't know if it's going to occur or not because I'm not on the Supreme Court, but that's what the Supreme Court should do. This is an easy layup case and to allow these lower courts to mess around with the rights is really offensive. But again, I'm not on the Supreme Court and I don't control them. So uh, we just have to wait and see what happens. So there you have it. All right, folks. I uh, hope you follow me on X at Four Boxes Diner where I tweet out a lot of this information and then some. Don't forget to follow me also here and subscribe and resubscribe. Some people keep getting knocked off and we will see you again soon here at the Four Boxes Diner. Orders up. Table 2A.